General Grant, the Confederate garrison at Fort Donelson has refused your demand for unconditional surrender. The young Union officer reported breathlessly as he entered the command tent. General Buckner says he wishes to discuss terms. Ulysses S. Grant, clad in his customary rumpled uniform, looked up from the field map strewn across the makeshift table. His face betrayed no emotion, but there was a determined glint in his eyes. There will be no terms, Grant replied firmly. My demand stands, unconditional and immediate surrender. Inform General Buckner that I will move upon his works without delay if he does not comply. The courier saluted crisply and hurried off to deliver the ultimatum. Grant turned to his assembled officers. Gentlemen, prepare your men. If Buckner does not surrender by dawn, we will take Fort Donelson by force. As the first rays of sunlight peeked over the horizon on that frigid February morning, the attack commenced. Union gunboats on the Cumberland River unleashed a barrage on the fort's outer defenses as Grant's infantry advanced through the frozen woods and ravines surrounding the stronghold. The Confederate defenders, already worn down by the bitter cold and dwindling supplies, soon began to waver under the relentless Federal assault. By late afternoon, the stars and stripes flew over Fort Donelson. Over 12,000 Confederate troops surrendered, dealing a devastating blow to the South. The victories at Forts Henry and Donelson had ripped open the gateway to the Confederacy, placing Kentucky firmly under Union control and exposing Tennessee to invasion. Grant, the architect of this stunning triumph, found himself hailed as a hero in the North. Unconditional surrender Grant, as he was now known, had delivered the first major victories to an anxious Union populace. But even as they savored the success, Grant and his fellow Union commanders knew tougher battles lay ahead in the dense woods and rugged hills of the Western Theater. Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnston, a renowned officer, was assembling a new Southern army at Corinth, Mississippi, determined to regain the initiative and avenge the losses of Forts Henry and Donelson. In early April, Johnston saw his chance. Grant had moved his army of the Tennessee deep into enemy territory, encamping at Pittsburgh landing on the banks of the Tennessee River. There they awaited the arrival of General Don Carlos Buell's army of the Ohio from Nashville. Sensing an opportunity to strike before the two Union armies could unite, Johnston rapidly shifted his men northward, closing in on Grant's unsuspecting troops. As dawn broke over the meadows and woodlets around Shiloh Church on April 6, the Confederates sprung their trap. Sweeping forward in three mighty lines of battle, Johnston's troops slammed into the disorganized Union camps strung out across the rolling terrain. Many Federals were caught entirely by surprise, some roused from their slumber by the rebel yell and crackle of musketry erupting around them. Grant, away from the front conferring with Buell Miles downstream, raced back to the battlefield to rally his men as disaster loomed. We had an awful time of it and got the worst of it, he grimly recounted later. At the Hornet's Nest, a tangle of dense woods and thickets, Union troops made a determined stand, desperately fending off wave after wave of Confederate attackers and buying time for Grant to establish a final defensive line near Pittsburgh Landing. But elsewhere, the Confederate onslaught could not be halted. By late afternoon, the battered Union army had been driven back nearly three miles, clinging to a last foothold along the bluffs of the Tennessee River. Desperate soldiers cowered under the bank as wounded comrades and stragglers poured past them to the rear. Thousands of cowards lined the banks of the river, crying piteously to be ferried over. An Ohio private recalled with disgust. Just as total defeat seemed imminent, a catastrophe struck the Confederates. In the swirling confusion of the battle, General Johnston rode forward and was struck down by a mini ball mortally wounded as he directed a local assault. Beauregard, his second-in-command, suspended offensive operations for the day, giving Grant precious time to regroup. As reinforcements from Buell poured onto the field during the night, Grant vowed to go on the attack at daylight. Tough business, this soldiering, Sherman remarked to Grant as they conferred in the darkness, gunfire still sputtering in the distance. But tomorrow we'll show these rebels the bayonet. As the sun rose over the blood-soaked Tennessee woods on April 7, Grant made good on his pledge, hurling his reinforced legions against the exhausted Confederates. Slowly, grudgingly, 
the rebels pulled back from the ground they had won at such heavy cost the day before. By afternoon Beauregard had seen enough. Knowing his decimated ranks could not withstand the unrelenting Union sledgehammer blows, he ordered a retreat to Corinth, abandoning the hard-fought field to Grant. The Battle of Shiloh two days of horrific slaughter in the backwoods of Tennessee ended in a narrow Union victory. But the victory had come at an appalling price. Over 13,000 Federal soldiers lay dead or wounded, carnage on a scale never before seen in America. The Confederates suffered nearly as heavily. But Grant, though reeling from the furnace of Shiloh, had once again wrested triumph from disaster, snatching survival from defeat when all seemed lost. The Southern attempt to reverse the verdict of Forts Henry and Donelson had been repulsed. Yet even as the guns fell silent around Shiloh Church, new threats emerged to imperil Union fortunes in the West. Confederate armies under Generals Braxton Bragg and Edmund Kirby Smith soon launched twin incursions from eastern Tennessee, thrusting into the heartland of Kentucky. By autumn, rebel columns had reached the outskirts of Louisville and Cincinnati as terror gripped the Ohio Valley. Once again, the fate of Kentucky and perhaps the war in the West hung in the balance. Responding to the crisis, the Union High Command quickly reshuffled its leadership. Halleck was summoned east to serve as General-in-Chief, while Grant, still under a cloud after Shiloh, was shunted into a vague administrative role. His most trusted subordinate William T. Sherman took charge of efforts to contain Confederate pressure in Mississippi. The task of halting Bragg's adventurous Kentucky campaign fell to the methodical General Don Carlos Buell. On October 8, Buell finally brought Bragg to battle outside Perryville, Kentucky. There, among the rolling hills and crooked ravines of the Chaplin River Valley, the two armies grappled in an intense but inconclusive combat. Though Bragg claimed victory, he soon retreated back to Tennessee in the face of Buell's ponderous pursuit, relinquishing the Confederacy's last hold on Kentucky. But Buell had failed to destroy Bragg's army when he had the chance an oversight that cost him his command. To President Lincoln's frustration, the war in the West seemed stalemated as 1862 drew to a close. That frustration finally boiled over in November when Lincoln dismissed the slow-moving Buell and elevated William Stark Rosecrans to lead the Union Army of the Cumberland. Impatient for results, Lincoln and his new General-in-Chief Halleck prodded Rosecrans to advance and confront Bragg, who lurked in the foothills of Middle Tennessee, guarding the approaches to Chattanooga. Just after Christmas, Rosecrans finally turned his 40,000 bluecoats south from Nashville and almost immediately collided with Bragg's Confederates along Stones River outside Murfreesboro. As a wintry fog blanketed the battlefield on December 31st, Bragg unleashed a powerful surprise attack that sent Rosecrans reeling. Many of his units broke under the sudden assault, but General George Thomas, the Rock of Chickamauga, rallied others to repel the rebel onslaught until darkness fell. Despite the drastic reversal, Rosecrans stubbornly held his ground rather than retreat. For two more days, in biting cold, the armies grappled along Stone's River without bringing the engagement to a decisive result. Finally, on January 2nd, Bragg disengaged and withdrew southward, leaving the field and a technical victory to his Union foe. The razor-thin triumph at Stone's River cost Rosecrans over 12,000 men, but it secured Middle Tennessee and demonstrated his mettle to Lincoln. The president's confidence was not misplaced. In the months that followed, Old Rosie carefully husbanded his strength, awaiting the opportunity to pounce. That chance finally came in June when Rosecrans maneuvered Bragg into abandoning Chattanooga, the linchpin of the Upper South, without firing a shot. This stunning coup left Rosecrans poised to drive a dagger into the heart of the Confederacy. Only Bragg's battered but determined Army of Tennessee stood in the way of an invasion of Georgia and Confederate defeat in the West. The stakes had never been higher as the Union prepared to cross the mountains beyond Chattanooga and force the issue with Bragg. Over 120,000 men in blue and gray steeled themselves for the climactic struggle to come. To the east, Robert E. Lee's invasion of Maryland that fall had ended in bloody stalemate at Antietam, forestalling the Confederacy's bold bid for intervention by Britain and France. In December, the Army of the Potomac, now under the resolute Ambrose Burnside, fought Lee to another standstill at Fredericksburg before bogging down in the mire of Northern Virginia. And to the west, 
Grant's capture of Vicksburg on July 4 had sealed the Confederacy's doom by severing it in two. Now only Bragg's veteran army stood in the path of the Union's irresistible momentum. In mid-September, Rosecrans launched his armies over the mountains south of Chattanooga, outflanking Bragg and sending him into headlong retreat. Flush with success, old Rosie surged after his foe, heedless of the danger. But Bragg had one final card to play. Near the little North Georgia hamlet of Chickamauga, he turned at bay, determined to destroy Rosecrans' overextended forces. There, in a tangled wilderness of oaks, cedars, and pines, Confederates and Federals bludgeoned each other for two days in the war's second bloodiest battle. Only the tenacity of Thomas, whose men beat back assault after rebel assault from positions on Snodgrass Hill and Horseshoe Ridge, staved off utter catastrophe. But when the guns fell silent, Rosecrans found himself sealed inside a tight perimeter around Chattanooga, his army battered and demoralized. As the autumn of 1863 waned, the contending armies glowered at one another from heights overlooking Chattanooga Rosecrans Federals occupying the town, Bragg's Confederates holding the high ground to the east and south. Bragg virtually controlled the Union supply lines. In a bold stroke, he dispatched Longstreet to lay siege to Burnside's force far to the northeast at Knoxville. With Rosecrans demoralized and dangerously isolated, Bragg appeared to hold the upper hand. At this perilous hour, Lincoln turned to the man who had twice before delivered victory from the jaws of disaster Ulysses S. Grant. Arriving in Chattanooga in October, Grant wasted no time opening a new supply route, the famous Cracker Line, that rescued the besieged Union garrison from starvation. He then set about amassing troops for a counterattack. Major General Joseph Hooker arrived with two corps from Virginia and Major General William T. Sherman rushed in from Mississippi. By mid-November, Grant had assembled over 80,000 men, poised to settle accounts with Bragg. On November 23rd, the Union offensive began. Hooker's men successfully assaulted Lookout Mountain on the Union right, while Sherman grappled with the Confederate left flank on Tunnel Hill. But the next day, November 24th, the decisive blow fell on Missionary Ridge in the center. There, 23,000 of Thomas's Army of the Cumberland rose up and stormed the commanding heights in Bragg's center, shattering the rebel defenses in one of the most dramatic charges of the entire war. By sundown, the routed Confederates were retreating into northern Georgia, never again to menace Chattanooga. Only Bragg's decision to detach Longstreet to Knoxville had prevented Sherman from turning the rebel retreat into a rout. The stunning victory at Chattanooga marked a turning point in the Western theater. Never again would a major Confederate army operate on the offensive there. Grant, the plain-spoken and unassuming general from Illinois, now stood head and shoulders above all other Union war leaders. Within months, he would be summoned east to assume supreme command of all Federal forces and lead them to final victory. As 1864 dawned, the Confederacy's fortunes stood on a knife's edge. Atlanta, the important manufacturing center and railroad nexus guarding the approaches to the Confederate heartland, now lay within reach of the invigorated Union forces in the West. If it fell, only scattered and demoralized rebel armies would stand between the North and final victory. To forestall this calamity, Confederate President Jefferson Davis turned to his most pugnacious and tenacious fighter General Joseph E. Johnston. Assuming command in Georgia, Johnston quickly set about preparing defenses to halt the inevitable Union onslaught. That onslaught arrived in early May, when Sherman led his armies forth from Chattanooga, beginning the long grapple through the rugged hills of North Georgia toward Atlanta. Adhering to his maxim that he would make Georgia howl, Sherman employed skillful flanking maneuvers to steadily press Johnston back toward the Gate City. From Rocky Face Ridge to Resica, from Cassville to Kennesaw Mountain, the armies clashed in a running battle of thrust and parry. By early July, Sherman had reached the banks of the Chattahoochee River, barely 10 miles from Atlanta. With the fate of the city, and perhaps the Confederacy hanging in the balance, Jefferson Davis lost patience with Johnston's endless retreats. In one of the war's most momentous decisions, Davis replaced his cautious general with the combative John Bell Hood virtually commanding Hood to assume the offensive and strike back at the invaders. Hood wasted no time in carrying out Davis's directive, 
lashing out at the Union forces in a series of furious attacks at Peachtree Creek and Atlanta itself. But despite initial success, Hood's assaults could not dislodge Sherman's tightening grip around the city. As August arrived, the Federals seized the critical railroads supplying Hood's army, forcing the Confederates to abandon Atlanta after a summer-long, bloody campaign. Hood retreated to Lovejoy Station, his army battered but still intact. To the north, Sherman occupied the smoldering ruins of Atlanta in early September, achieving the most decisive Union victory of the year. The fall of Atlanta electrified the North and ensured President Lincoln's re-election two months later. But despite this momentous triumph, the Confederacy still clung tenaciously to life as 1864 neared its end. Lee's army remained defiant in Virginia, having parried Grant's relentless hammering throughout the spring and summer. And in Georgia, John Bell Hood looked to reverse Atlanta's verdict with a bold counterstroke of his own. In November, he led his tattered but determined army northwest into Tennessee, hoping to defeat the Union forces there in detail and march onto the Ohio River. Hood's quixotic campaign nearly trapped a Union Corps at Spring Hill, Tennessee, and then led to a vicious battle outside Nashville in mid-December. There, on the hills south of the city, Hood hurled his army in a series of piecemeal attacks against the carefully prepared defenses of George Thomas, now leading the Union forces in the west. The Confederates managed to puncture the Federal lines in several places, but could not break through. As darkness fell on December 15th, a powerful Union counterattack sent Hood's shattered forces reeling rearward in disarray. Only a skillfully managed rearguard action the next day prevented the Battle of Nashville from becoming an outright Confederate rout. Even as Hood's beaten troops limped back toward Mississippi, Sherman was embarking on a march that would sear itself into American memory. Having captured Atlanta and secured it as a base, he now resolved to strike for Savannah, living off the land and destroying all in his path. In mid-November, Sherman set forth with 60,000 hardened veterans on his March to the Sea, a 285-mile trek across the Confederate heartland of Georgia. For the next month, cut loose from all communication with the North, Sherman's legions laid waste to the richest section of the South, still untouched by war, burning and pillaging as they drove relentlessly toward the Atlantic coast. Savannah fell in late December, delivering to Lincoln a much-celebrated Christmas gift. The end was now in sight. In April 1865, Lee's half-starved army of Northern Virginia finally collapsed after a grueling 10-month siege in the trenches around Richmond and Petersburg, fleeing westward with Grant's forces in hot pursuit. After a harrowing retreat, Lee met Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, on April 9th. There, in a poignant scene, the two foremost generals of the war acted out the final surrender of the Confederacy's most celebrated army, effectively ending the four-year-long Civil War. In North Carolina, Johnston's beleaguered force, all that remained to contest Sherman's march northward from Savannah, surrendered to Sherman on April 26th at Bennett Place, having learned of Lee's surrender over two weeks before. Across the Mississippi, Kirby Smith's small army of occupation in Texas dissolved in May, and the last sizable Confederate force still in the field under Edmund Kirby Smith surrendered on June 2nd. The guns had finally fallen silent across the vast expanse of the war-torn nation. The great challenge of knitting the fractured country back together again now loomed before the victorious Union. But that task would have to be undertaken without the man who had led the nation through its darkest hour. On April 14th, just five days after Lee's surrender, John Wilkes Booth, a fanatical Confederate sympathizer, shot Abraham Lincoln at Ford's Theater in Washington. The president lingered through the night before succumbing to his wound the next morning, leaving a stricken nation to mourn his loss and ponder the difficult road ahead. Despite the tragedy of Lincoln's death, one thing was clear in the spring of 1865. The Union had been saved and the scourge of slavery that had divided the nation since its inception had been eradicated. The terrible sacrifices of four years, the hundreds of thousands dead, the tides of destruction that had swept across the land had not been in vain. A new birth of freedom, as Lincoln himself had so eloquently envisioned at Gettysburg, was now possible. The war in the West, those decisive campaigns waged across the vast expanse between the Appalachians and the Mississippi, had proven instrumental to the conflict's outcome. The rivers and railroads that snaked across that vast theater 
had served as the vital arteries of the Union armies, allowing them to penetrate deep into the southern heartland. The capture of Vicksburg and Chattanooga, the march to the sea these campaigns had sealed the Confederacy's fate every bit as much as the more heralded battles in the East. Lincoln himself had recognized this and had long pushed his Western generals to press the fight. In Ulysses S. Grant, William T. Sherman, George H. Thomas, and others, he had found the aggressive, hard-driving commanders needed to carry the war to the enemy. For the South, the West was both a bastion of strength and a fatal vulnerability. The rich agricultural lands of the region, the Confederacy's breadbasket proved both a blessing and a curse. They sustained the Southern people, but also beckoned invitingly to the Northern invaders. Once the rivers and railroads fell under Union control, these same highways allowed Federal forces to slash the lifelines of the South. And despite the best efforts of the Confederacy's Western champions Albert Sidney Johnston, Braxton Bragg, Joseph E. Johnston, John Bell Hood, they could not match the Union's overwhelming numbers and resources. Once the blue-clad armies passed the Appalachians in strength, the Confederacy's days were numbered. And so, as spring blossomed across a war-weary nation in 1865, Americans North and South began to contemplate the daunting challenges of the post-war world. The Union, so long strained, had survived its greatest test, but at a staggering cost in blood and treasure. Slavery was dead, but the wounds of war gaped raw, and sectional bitterness still smoldered. For African Americans, a new world of freedom and citizenship beckoned, but so too did a long struggle for true equality under the law. The country itself stood on the threshold of a profound economic and social transformation, as industrialization and westward expansion began to reshape the American landscape. The world the Civil War made was very different from the one in which that conflict had begun just four short years before. For the soldiers, North and South, who had carried the burden of those four years of fighting, a final reckoning remained. Uniforms were put away, weapons laid down for good. But the memories of the great struggle of fallen comrades, of battles lost and won, of a nation and a way of life changed forever would endure. In the decades to come, a generation of aging veterans in blue and gray would gather at battlefield parks to rehash the old campaigns, to marvel at how far the country had traveled, to ponder the conflict's causes and consequences. For the rest of their lives, they would carry with them the pride of having served, whether in victory or defeat, in the great American Civil War.